I came over to the building yesterday over here at the sanctuary, and I spent about half a day. I usually come over here and pray, but I don't usually come spend half the day on Saturday. <clears throat> and I felt like, <clears throat> pardon me, I felt like um, I just needed to make some changes. And um, not necessarily do I need to, every time I feel like God does something in my heart, do I need to come out here and tell everybody what it is, but I felt like I needed to this time. <laughs> Um, I think most of you know that I, that I spent the, the vast majority of my life, I spent all of my growing up in the, in the southeastern part of the United States, the south. <clears throat> and uh, then 27 years of my adult life pastoring in the south. And um, if you've never been in a culture sometime, you hear about it, but it's hard to understand it. And when you're in the south, you know, and especially in the Bible Belt, and I was in the teeth of the Bible Belt, um, it's so Christianized. When I say that, Christian influence saturates the culture even if people aren't Christians. If I were to take you to where I was from, uh, there's more Christians than there are people. <clears throat> okay? Um, they don't open the mall till church is over. They have laws called blue laws. You can buy alcohol every day but Sunday. Some of y'all be, y'all's nerves be shot by that right there. <laughs> they still pray over the loudspeaker in the high school. They don't care what the law is. They pledge allegiance to the flag and they pray over the loudspeaker in the high school. That, that's the South. So if somebody gets saved where I'm from, and they 35 years old and never been saved, they can probably come in and start living a Christian lifestyle somewhere at about a six because they've been exposed to it. Whether they accepted it or not, they've been exposed to it probably their whole life. And um, so when you come to Easter and when you come to Christmas, you know, there's no Greek word study. There's no Hebrew word study. Christmas is what it is. Easter is what it is. Christmas is the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Easter is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's, there's no other way to couch it. It is what it is, and it is the two landmarks of our faith. So back there, 27 years, you gotta find a new way to couch an extremely familiar message that people have been taught in Sunday school since they were toddlers. And so I was coming this, this week and I was gonna take the heavenly chaos and twist it in with a little Easter and I had my thing all packaged up and way to do it. And yesterday when I came in here for my prayer time, I just felt like God said, you're not in the South, Ron. And he reminded me of my first encounter when I moved here. I, when I first moved here, you gotta understand I was totally unfamiliar with this area. Th this move out here is such a miracle because I really had no connection to it outside of pastor. None. I had no connection to the whole West Coast. And, you know, I was totally unaware of y'all's remarkable rent prices. <laughs> the insanity of the rent prices. <clears throat> and, um, so I got a, a, a realtor, you know, I didn't know how to get anywhere. I had to get a GPS to get to a gas station. I didn't know where I was. And um, I, I, we got a realtor to carry us around and just let us look at some possibilities. And the gentleman, prince of a man, prince of a man, wonderful man, he's a Persian gentleman. And uh, <clears throat> I asked him to come to church. I told him I was taking over a church here and I, asked, I invited him to church. He looked at me and said, what is a church? In South Carolina? So I, you know, I said, what is, he said, what is a church? He said, what is a pastor? He said, what is it you do? And I had to step back about 30 minutes and conceptually construct for him what a church was and what it was that I did. Okay? He came. 
He still comes every once in a while. He'll probably be here Sunday. He'll probably be here next Sunday. He came, and he didn't even know what to do. He sat on the back row, and while everybody was shouting, he's going. He just knew he was happy. He didn't know what was going on, but he knew he was happy. And when he walked out in the foyer, he walked up to the table and said, how do I join this club? <laughs> no, this is all And then he said, how much are the dues? And I looked at the people at the table. I said, did you tell him 10%? The dues are 10%. <laughs> Does And then his last thing was, when is his next speech? And so when God brought that to my mind yesterday, I'm in the Bay Area of California, and you know what? I don't need to twist anything or be creative. Easter just needs to be Easter. I want you to walk with me as my goal in 30 minutes. I don't care if you've never heard it in your life and you're just here today because grandma said if you didn't come see her grandson baptized, you weren't gonna eat none of her cooking ever again. And if that's the only reason you're here, when you walk out of here today, you're gonna know the gospel of Jesus Christ when you leave here today. Will you give me a half hour to do that? Can we do that today? Look at your neighbor and say, Easter is Easter. Come on, Dad. Throw Romans 1 on the screen. I know we shout, we, man, that there's nobody better to preach to than redemption, and, and you can still do it today, but I am gonna have a different type of delivery today. I, I've never seen myself as a, a great storyteller. I'm more of a teacher. But today I'm gonna do some, some narrating type things, deliver a little differently. But if you find you a praise spot, go ahead. You praise however much you want to. This is the book of Romans. The apostle Paul wrote it. It's the church at Rome. Jesus has died, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven. The 12 disciples are now the 12 apostles and they are evangelizing the known world. And then you have these letters, Philippians, Ephesians, Romans, Corinthians. These are letters to churches in that city. Romans is known to be the greatest theological dissertation in, that has ever been written. If you hadn't read the book of Romans, you need to read it, it's fascinating. This is how Paul starts the book. A bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophet. So he said, I'm called to be an apostle. In other words, I'm a church planter. I'm going around and I'm starting churches. I've been separated by God unto this purpose for the cause of Jesus, which has been prophesied about through prophets in the scriptures for years. Next verse. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, <clears throat> who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, the lineage of King David, Israel's second king, created the bloodline through which Jesus would be born earthly into. Okay, but listen to this and declared to be the Son of God with power. Who? Okay. He's from the seed of David as a man, but he's been declared to be the Son of God. I need more proof. I need more proof. Who is this Jesus that I can stake eternity? That I can go to the grave and know that I'm kept? Who is this Jesus that I can pillow my head on his promises in my most desperate hour? How, who is this Jesus that I know I'm right when everybody looks me in the face and tells me I'm wrong? Who is he? Son of God? I ain't got no problem with son of David. That don't bother me. But son of God, you got to give me something. I intend to. Lord, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Let your neighbor say, give him 30 minutes. Come on, tell him, say, give him 30 minutes. You excited about this? 
The essence of the gospel of Jesus, this is very important. I want everybody to be able to contextually speak intelligently about the good news of Jesus when you leave this building. The essence of the gospel of Jesus is that God is love. In the Bible, God declares two things about himself. He said he is a spirit and he said he is love. He is a spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is a spirit. He don't have this. He's a spirit. Doesn't have flesh. And he is love, not the capacity to love, not loves. He is love. He's a spirit and he's love. The very core nature of love is that it has to have an object in which to express itself. It is not love if there's nothing to love. So God created something in his image to express the true essence of who he is because he wanted something to love so badly, he created something in his image and in his likeness to love. Because that is what love does, and if he is love, then that is how it activates itself. So he created something to love, okay? But love cannot be forced, love can be chosen. So then we get into great theological debates, did God create evil? And why is bad in the world? If God is so good, why is there so much bad in the world? Because let me tell you, when love, for it to be true love, it is chosen, it is not forced. So God loved Adam, but for love to be love, he gave Adam the choice to love him back. Okay, I chose hope. I picked her out in a concert. I walked all over a college campus till I found her. When I found her, I went and got on my knee and introduced myself to her. And as soon as I could afford it, I put a ring on it. I chose hope. Nobody made me do it. Nobody forced me to do it because the true essence of love is expressed in a choice. So therein lies the potential for evil. You can choose to love me back or you can choose not to love me back. If I pull up at my house when my children were little and I've been gone speaking at conferences three or four days, airplanes, hotels, and I drive back up in my driveway and my kids are playing and I drive up, I don't want my wife to pull all the kids in the corner and say, now your dad's home, I need you to go hug him. I don't want that hug. Nobody wants that hug. That's a terrible hug. But if I can drive up in the driveway and they throw the bicycle down and they drop the football, come on, and they toss the Barbie in the air and everybody comes running and grabbing my leg, oh my goodness, I love you and you have chosen to love me back. That's the hug that I want. And the nature of love makes a choice to do it. And God gave Adam the choice and Adam chose poorly. And when Adam chose rebellion, he declared independence from God and independence from heaven. And at that moment, every vile, twisted, carnal, evil thing entered the earth because in the day you do, ye shall be like God, knowing good and evil. I only wanted you to know good. But because I leave you with a choice, there's the potential for evil and he released evil into the earth. Am I doing all right so far? This is the essence of the gospel. So now man is lost because the thing that God hates, sin, has gotten inside of the thing he loves, people. So for God to get back with the thing he loves, he's gotta do something about the thing he hates. The only problem is God has already marked off the parameters. Let man have dominion in the earth. So earth is man's domain. It is not a spirit's domain. You have to have this 
in the earth to have authority. Outside of that, you have no authority. And God is a spirit. So God has a dilemma. If I'm gonna save what's in the earth, man, I'm gonna have to become one. And his name shall be Emmanuel. God with us. And we call his name Jesus. Come on somebody. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So God sent his only begotten son and heaven emptied itself and God emptied himself and took on the form of a lowly man because if you're gonna save man, you've got to become man. And through his death, burial, and resurrection in the earth as a man, the son of God, I, putting my faith in him, have access to all of his promises in this life, the ones I teach you every Sunday. They're yours. He bought them for you. He purchased them for you. And then when I lay my head to rest at the end of my days, my eternity is secure. That, my friend, is the essence of the gospel of Jesus and it's worth a mighty hand clap offering right there where you are. Amen? Now let me keep laying this out. Can I keep going? Somebody say amen. amen. John 20, verses 11 through 15. I'm going to lay this out for you. John 20. I've referred to this several times in some of my other teaching, but I felt like I needed to read it. Now, Jesus has been on the cross. They now have taken him and laid him in the tomb. And Mary Magdalene, of whom he cast out seven demons. If anybody's grateful, this woman's grateful. Okay? is going to the tomb. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. In other words, he wasn't there anymore, but there are two angels sitting at both ends. Okay? Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because you've taken my Lord and I don't know where you've laid him. So she sees my Lord is gone. I don't know where he is. That's all she sees, and that is her emotional response. But look at the angels. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Verse 15, I'll quote on from there. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She asked the same thing as the angels. Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be the gardener, said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, I'll take him away. I don't think we have the next verse on there. But Jesus said, basically, I am he that was dead and am alive forevermore. Now here's where I want to go with this narrative today. I've often talked about the fact that there is a spirit realm in which God works in that is invisible to physical people. When you talk about invisible, it does not pertain to the object, it pertains to the subject, your eye. It means that the things are there, but your eye does not have the ability to perceive the image, okay? So there is an invisible world, the one in which your God, who is a spirit, functions in. That's why she's weeping, the angels are not weeping, and Jesus is not weeping. She's crying, why? She sees what is but there's things going on she don't know. And so she's crying, but the angels aren't crying and Jesus is not crying because they understand there's something much more than an empty tomb going on right here. The Bible says on the cross, Jesus breathed his last and he gave up the ghost. So Jesus, spirit, soul, and body, his spirit went back to be with God. Okay? His body was laid in a tomb. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, this is profound, says that his soul descended into Hades. Another word for hell. And the Bible there says he preached to all the souls before Noah. He went back in time to a people destroyed in a flood that never got to hear the message and he preached his own gospel to the souls and allowed people before the flood 
to have a chance to accept him as Lord and Savior. While he was there, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. Hallelujah. And then the resurrection is the body of Jesus, the soul of Jesus, and the spirit of Jesus coming back together into life, saying, I am Alpha, and I am Omega. I am he who was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Can somebody take five seconds and bless the name of the Lord your God? Hallelujah. Ah, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I'm supposed to be telling a story. They're, they're pushing me with that organ. I'm supposed to be storytelling. <laughs> God placed them in a garden when he created them. Genesis says there was four streams coming into that garden. I teach that wealth never comes from one stream. The garden was a place of perfection and a place of wealth because it was, it was funded and it was fueled by many streams flowing into it. There was no toil, there was no sweat. The flowers in the garden, the color of the vegetation was so colorful, so vibrant, so bright, it would exercise every muscle in your eye just to catch the hue, just to catch the color of everything in the garden. It was protected by cherubim with flaming swords. There was no sweat of the brow. There was no work and Adam could say a thing and whatever he would say would happen. The Bible says whatever he called it, that's what it was. Placed in a perfect place in a world that was meant to respond to his words. He didn't work it, he talked to it. And when he talked to it, it would become whatever he would call it because God in heaven would back up what he said in the earth and he had creative power with his words. You had streams glistening over rocks. You had the lion laying down with the lamb. You had perfection because it was called Eden, which means paradise or heaven. It was heaven on earth. And Adam lived there and God provided it for him. When he sinned, every vile, infectious thing, every disease, every carnal, every evil, every unbelievable thing began to flood the earth. And at that time, Adam and Eve were banned from the garden, not as punishment, but for salvation. They were banned from the garden because there was not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there were two trees in the garden. There was the tree of life. Nobody talks about that one. And Jesus said, I mean, God said, get them out of the garden lest they eat from the tree of life as well. Because if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they are lost and then eat from the tree of life, they will be lost forever. So God getting them out of the garden was not punishment, it was mercy. <laughs> and guarding the gate of the garden that held the tree of life was two cherubim with flaming swords. And they looked back over their shoulder with tears running down their face. Why? At a paradise lost. And then there goes the Bible. Exodus, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name tw changed to Israel. Israel has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Moses came and Moses went. And then they had the era of the judges and you had your Gideons and you had your Samsons and they came and they went and Israel wanted a king. So we had the era of the kings and they came and they went and the era of the prophets and they came and they went and they had the priesthood and the priesthood came and the priesthood went and the blood of a million goats and the blood of a million pigeons and the blood of a million bulls would never ever save mankind. They would only stop the judgment of God for another day. Because God himself said, without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. So number one, it'll have to be a man and it'll have to be shedding of blood because only a man has dominion in the earth and by blood being shed is the only way sins can be removed. 
And those were the parameters that God himself laid out. Then the Bible says he was born in the fullness of time. Stay with me. Take this journey with me. How would he come? The prophets have foretold of him for years <coughs> that he would be a king of the lineage of David. How would he come? Would there be pomp and pageantry? Would there be trumpets blowing in the streets? Would they be rolling out red carpet? Would there be purple royal robes and crowns? Would there be stallions? Would there be chariots? Would there be fire? Would there be celebration? How would he come? How would, he, how would the Son of God make his entrance into the world? And he was born in a manger in Bethlehem with shepherds abiding by their sheep by night, three magi chasing a star, and there was no room for him in the inn, born to an unwed pregnant teenager who's trying to explain to a world how she got pregnant by a spirit. And so God sends a message to the world. I didn't come to save the mighty but I came to reach all the way down into the depths of people with the biggest problems, the biggest hurts, and the lowest thing that life has to bring. And I will bring them up and set their feet on a high place. I'm about to run all over this building right now. He reached right down into the most hurting people, to the most hurting place, right into the smallest town and brought big things out of nothing, hallelujah, because that's the message God wanted to send as he entered into the world. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. <laughs> and they say that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. He was trained as any boy would be trained. And Hebrew custom, Hebrew, Hebrew tradition, he was raised as an apprentice in his father's carpentry business and he was known as the carpenter's son. Mary and Joseph were married and they were like any other family and he was like any other boy growing up to become a man. And there was nothing about him, the Bible said, that would have drawn our attention to him. The Bible didn't talk about him being overly handsome or anything to look at. The Bible said he was very normal to look at and would blend in and would fit in with anybody else. If you read the words of the prophets. And then there was age 30. When he's walking and John the Baptist stops his conference meeting. He says, behold, We've killed a billion lambs. But here comes the lamb that takes away the sins of the whole world. This is the last one right here. After this one, there won't be a need for another one. And Jesus walked and he was baptized that day. And when he was baptized, the Bible tells us that the heavens opened up and the Spirit of God descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, this is my son, son of God. Not, this is not the son of David. This is the son of God in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus left that meeting and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to heal those that are lame, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. They begin to speak of him walking on water to defy physics, defy the elements. He would speak to win and it would stop blowing. Amen. Who is this man and from where does he get his authority? For they had never seen someone speak with such authority. He speaks to a fig tree and it dies. He speaks to water and it quits filling the boat. He speaks to a dead carcass in a tomb, Lazarus, and it comes out alive. 
He takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And then after everyone is full, picks up 12 basketfuls left over. Why? Because God sends the message, nothing will be wasted. Nothing in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the broken, the mistakes, the bad decisions, the screw ups, God will waste nothing for all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And whatever pieces of life you've got left over God will pull it all back together somebody shout nothing is wasted he'll use it all I don't care how bad you messed it up <laughs> he draws from his earthly ministry and he becomes to close in three and a half years later at age 33 and a half he begins to close in on what he was born for because he was born to die. They didn't understand. They want the teaching on the hillside to continue. They want the fireside chats to continue. They want the healing and the miracle services to continue, but that wasn't why he came. Because he was declared to be the son of God. Why? Not because he was a miracle worker. No, I need more proof. Because Moses threw down his staff and it became a snake, but Pharaoh's magicians threw down theirs and it became a snake too. He's not the son of God because he works miracles. Not the son of God because he's a great teacher. Confucius is a teacher. Buddha taught. That doesn't separate him as the son of God. Well, he was an amazing leader. Hitler was a leader. You going to put him in that group? Son of God, I need something. I need something. Those things don't separate him because other people do that. So he comes down to what we call the Last Supper, which was a gathering of his 12 disciples, knowing it, knowing it would be their last meal together. And he begins to give instructions. And he said, but one of you is a devil. And for three and a half years, he had had Judas in his circle. The grace of God to let someone stay in his circle that he knows is gonna sell him out. And they all looked around and said, is it I, is it I? And he said, he who sticks his hand in the bowl with me, that's who it is. And about that time, him and Judas's hand touched as they dipped their bread in the bowl. Jesus cut his eyes at him and said, whatever thou doest, do quickly. Judas ran. He found the Roman soldiers along with the chief priests and the elders and received from them 30 pieces of silver that he might sell the Son of God out. If you would allow me to, I believe right now, Judas and the bowels and the cackles of hell can hear 30 pieces of silver jingling in his ear as he realized he sold the Prince of God out. Why scribes? Why Pharisees? Because sinners didn't hate him. Religion did. Sinners didn't kill him. Religion killed him. Because Jesus never called anyone to a religion. In fact, he hated religion. And whenever he got around religious people, he scorched them. He would look at a sinner and say, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. But when he looked at the others, he looked at them and said, you whitewashed wall. You brood of vipers. He hated religion because the word religion means conforming to an outer code. And Jesus don't want your behavior to form to an outer code. He wants to come live in your heart and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not an outside job. It's an inside job. <laughs> After he was sold out, they come and they arrest him. And Jesus said, all this time I've been with you and you come at me with swords. And Peter takes out his sword and cuts off a Roman soldier's ear. I love Peter. <laughs> Jesus reaches down and grabs his ear. 
best plastic surgeon you've ever seen in your life just places it right back on his head. And they take Jesus and they begin to question him. And the Bible says he utters not a word. And they strap him to a flogging post. Now earth sees a man, but heaven is watching. The crown jewel of heaven. The bright and the morning star. The one who made all things and by whom for all things are made is strapped to a flogging post like an animal. <laughs> Opening up his back. One stripe at a time until his entrance was showing. And heaven is watching in disbelief. The angels, legions, millions, time 10 millions of angels that are pressing against the gates of heaven, just waiting for God to give the word, to go and cut the prince of God loose. And God holds up his hand and says, no, he'll finish. And they're looking, how long will God let this go on? The son of God. The word himself is being beat like an animal on a flogging post, wreathing and writhing in pain and they're watching with disbelief. But contrary to what people leave the Bible, the, the prophet Isaiah said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? Not because God's some type of sadomasochist. It's because he knew that at the end of this work, Generations would sit before him as family of believers. And he knew this was the only day, only way to redeem a planet back to him. <clears throat> they put a cross on his back and had him crawl, carried up a dusty hill, Golgotha, the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. They laid him on the cross and they pierced his feet and they pierced his hands and then they walked that cross up in the air and they let it hit that cold ground with a thud and his body pulls against those nails and he reads and he writhes in pain as now the Son of God is suspended halfway between heaven and earth and earth turns its head and heaven turns its head and he's there all alone. The Roman soldier comes and pierces his side and blood and water flows and they take turns, strike him in the face with sticks and the Bible said, pulled the hair out of his face. He cried, I thirst and they give him vinegar. Until the third hour when they said, Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani, which means my God, my God. How can you send me here to do this? We've never been apart. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why? The Bible says he bows his head and whew, gives up the ghost. Hell laughed. Because when Adam declared independence, the Bible says that Satan became the God of this world. And he knew there was only one obstacle standing in the way of his eternal reign, the man Jesus. If I can remove Jesus, my reign will be unending. And finally, the man Jesus, God took religion I mean, Satan took religion to kill him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Hell breaks forth in celebration. Demons being tired of being cast out now have their authority back. Son of God is dead. Hopes are gone. Dreams are vanished. God is dead. 
But everybody was enjoying the celebration a bit more than Satan himself because Satan knew that there was a three-day window because Jesus had one time said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And they thought he was talking about the Old Testament temple. But he was saying, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. So while they celebrated, he was gonna give himself a three day pass and wait and make sure all things were finished. And the Bible says that Jesus descended into the depths of the earth, into Hades. And there came a knock at the rusty gates of hell. <laughs> and Satan turns around and looks at the gates of hell and says, oh my God. And Jesus says, you got it. And he takes the gates of hell and he throws them off their rusty hinges and he throws death to one side and he throws the crumbling empire of sin to the other. He goes and gets the keys of death, hell and the grave and he raises the keys and says, I am Alpha, I am Omega. I am he that was dead and I am alive forevermore. And when he got up, you got up. Your family got up, your kids got up, your marriage got up, your body got up, your finances got up, everything got up when he got up, your mind got up, your attitude got up, and now your shame is on him, and now your past is on him, and now your mistakes are on him, and your bad decisions are on him, and your diseases and sicknesses are on him, because he has been declared to be the Son of God with power, by the resurrection of the dead. Give your God 30 seconds of praise in this building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, 20 more seconds. Raise it in this place. Raise it in this place. Raise it in this place. Five, four, Three, two, shout hallelujah. High five, three people say, my God is a great God, my God. My, 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 my. For Romans 1, 4, back on the screen, the last part. And declared to be the Son of God with power. Not because he's a healer, a teacher, a leader. But next verse, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He's the son of God because no one else died and got up again. Come on somebody. Could I have you stand with me, please, all over the building? In John chapter 10, Jesus, in a different context, said that same statement. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And then he asked a question. He said, do you believe this? Because quite honestly, as we close out this service, it don't matter if God believes it. I can tell you Satan believes it. He's experienced it. It doesn't matter for you if I believe it. Do you believe it? Because you only experience it when you believe it. And because he died and because he got up, 
is how I know my eternity is secure. How I can pillow my head on my Bible in my most desperate hour. And how I can say I know I'm right if they all say I'm wrong. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I don't need to say anything else. I've laid it out for you. If you just say, Pastor, I believe. I feel him. I'm experiencing him right now. And I want to be saved. I don't doubt anymore. I believe. I don't want him to be your God, Pastor. I want him to be my God. If that's you in this hallowed moment with head bowed and eyes closed, just throw your hand in the air. Just say, I, I want it to be me. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, hands going up all over the building. Yes, yes. Yes, I can't count them. I don't know how many that is. Wow, hands going up all over the building. Pray this prayer with me. Say it out loud. Everyone in the building and those of you at home, online, in your car, in your office, wherever you may be, sitting on your porch, doesn't matter. Say it with me. Say, I thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price for my salvation. I put my faith in you. I believe you died and rose again for me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said yes to Jesus, help us help you. Take 15 seconds and fill this out and turn it in and we have a gift for you. We have a chance to pack this building out and see hundreds of people saved next week. But you got to ask somebody to come with you. I want you to have a great Easter resurrection week. And let's come in here and blow this roof off next Sunday. May the Lord bless you. You're dismissed. Go enjoy this great day. Hallelujah. Love you. We'll see you next week.